episode of Making the Rounds, we're delving into the world of epilepsy and seizure disorders. This condition affects millions of people worldwide, and we want to shed light on the importance of managing it effectively and the advancements in its treatment. To learn more about these topics or other neurological offerings at Banner Health, please visit bannerhealth.com forward slash neurology. Making the Rounds dives into medical topics with those who know them best healthcare providers. My name is Bridget and I'll be your host for today's episode. And if you're new to our podcast, thank you for tuning in. And if you're a regular listener, welcome back. Joining me today on Making the Rounds is Dr. Steve Chung, a neurologist specializing in epilepsy care and the medical director at the Banner University Medicine Phoenix Comprehensive Epilepsy Center and professor of neurology at the University of Arizona College of Medicine Phoenix. Thank you for joining me, Dr. Chung, and welcome to Making the Round. Thanks for having me today. Well, we're excited to have you. So, Dr. Chung, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into epilepsy medicine. Well, I'm a neurologist to begin with and decided to specialize in epilepsy knowing how much evolving field this has been the last decade. Not only we have uh, so many different medications and surgical options, we also dive dive into the patient's overall etiology, cause for the epilepsy, and moving towards a cure. So that really excited me and being part of this epilepsy journey over the past uh, 25 years now. Well, thank you for being here. And also huge congratulations on your recent accreditation by the National Association of Epilepsy Centers as a level four epilepsy center for 2023 and 2024. So for our listeners who are not familiar with this designation, Level four epilepsy centers are recognized for having the professional expertise and facilities to provide the highest level of medical and surgical evaluation and treatment for patients with complex epilepsy. Yeah, thank you. It's truly a team effort to get us here. We have been level three for uh, for a longer period of time, but we decide it's about time to provide more comprehensive care, including the surgical entity, implantation devices, as well as uh, other uh, diagnostic procedures we offer. So we're very happy to be part of level four, and we're actually uh, dealing with a lot more patients for surgical options and surgical care. Well, congratulations. So let's start by giving our listeners an overview of the scope of epilepsy in the United States, particularly the number of affected individuals and how many are well controlled with medications. Yes. So we have a growing number of uh, patients with diagnosis of epilepsy now. When I was training 20, 30 years ago, we estimated only about 1.5 million people back then. Now, our recent estimate is 3.5 million people. Interesting fact about that is a lot of people think that epilepsy are something that people are born with. But as a matter of fact, if you look at how many patients are pediatric out of that 3.7 million versus adult, it's actually almost like a one to two. So there are more adult population. Some of them start to have seizures in adult life due to head trauma, stroke, uh, uh, brain tumor, and infection. But yet some other patients are actually has start having seizures in childhood and then grow into the adulthood. So right now, cross-sectionally, we have about 2 million, 2.5 million people in adult population, age 18 and above and remaining in pediatric population. What's more important is not all patients are going to be fully controlled with the medications or other modalities that we provide. We estimate about 30% of overall population, whether they have uh, generalized seizures or focal seizures, they tend to refractory, tend to be refractory to various number of medications. So Dr. Chung, what is the current state of seizure medication management and can you provide insights into those types of medications available for treating seizures? Yeah, let me start with saying that epilepsy is defined as a tendency to have recurrent seizures. So a lot of people use it interchangeably, but seizure is a single event. Epilepsy is more of a disease state. So seizures are actually very, very common. If you look at the newborns, um, we estimate one in 25 are born these days will eventually develop to have a single seizure or recurrent seizures. When we have a single seizure, we don't necessarily treat them. It may be due to some of the provoking factors such as uh, 
uh, illicit drugs and acute head trauma, but they may not be need to be treated for longer term. However, many of them, once they have at least two events, then they tend to have recurrent seizures, third and fourth and so on, and that's, that, that's when we start treating with seizure medications. One important thing I need to mention, even though we have a 30 some seizure medications available these days, none of them is actually curing the underlying cause of the seizures. It is interesting, we kind of lump it together as epilepsy or seizures, but there are many different reasons why they have seizures. I mentioned some of the things like stroke and head trauma, more common ones, but there's so genetic aberrance and the birth defect, all of those things constitute having seizures. So for that reason, we don't really dive into the cause of epilepsy a whole lot. When we're treating with me medications, we're just addressing to prophylactically or preventing the next seizure by providing medications. So you mentioned over 30 seizure medications are available, and I, I find that fascinating that there are so many seizure medications available to our patients. Yeah. Can you elaborate on the challenges faced by that remaining 30% of patients who don't respond to the medication and require further intervention. Yeah. So you don't have to fail too many medications to be established as a refractory seizure population or epilepsy. Study shows that once you fail two medication, not because of the side effect, but due to inefficacy, the chance for the third medication to work completely is less than 5%. So that's where we draw the line. So if you fail two medications, we call them or uh, eligible to be called as refractory seizure population. So only two out of that 30 some medications. The real challenge is then what to do with those, those patients. Keep trying different medications, one option. And we also have to understand finding a right medication for that patient. And that's where a little bit of art and science come together. We have to recognize uh, some seizures medications have side effects, actually all of them do, and but different type of side effects depends on their age, their uh, previously seen side effects, concurrent medications, or other concomitant disease, such as a headache and uh, mood disorder, all those kind of things come into play uh, when you choose a medication for the individual patient. So we try to be individual, individualized medication depends on their situation, seizure types and cause, and all other things I mentioned. So Dr. Chung, let's shift our focus a little bit to the surgical interventions yeah. for epilepsy. Could you provide an overview of the various surgical modalities available for patients with refractory epilepsy? So yeah, so epilepsy surgery as an elective, we are reserving that for the refractory population that I just defined. Uh, the reason for that is even though the medication can work in some po certain population, third and fourth, sometimes seventh, tenth medication or combination of it, many of them still are refractory. As we mentioned, about 30%, which is counts about a million people in America, will have refractory epilepsy uh, that can occur monthly, weekly, or sometimes daily. That's where the surgical entity comes in. The simple idea here is if we can identify some part of the brain that's causing seizures, then we can remove that part with a various technique, whether utilizing the laser ablation or actual resection in some other ways, thermal um, de degradation, we can actually remove that part of the brain and make them seizure free. Overall, well-selected population, our track record shows about 85% seizure freedom. If we know two things, number one, are we sure about the epileptic focus? That's number one. And second part is, is it safe to take it out? Obviously, we, we do not want to cause more trouble by providing the epilepsy surgery. So once two conditions are met, then we tend to offer those who have refractory population and have a chance to become seizure free. So the resective surgery, whether you use a laser or knife, or sometimes with a gamma knife as well, radiation, those are really the removing the focus of the brain. Now there are different type of surgery utilizing the devices. You mentioned the deep brain stimulation. There's something called RNS and VNS, vagus nerve stimulator. Those are the devices designed to reduce 
the number of seizures or seizure burden rather than addressing specific part of the focus and removing that area. So the target is different. The resective surgery, our goal is to make them make the seizure go away completely. Devices, DBS, RNS, and VNS, all together is to reduce as much as we can, uh, reduce the number of seizures. So the importance of knowing the exact location and ensuring safety during epilepsy surgery is key. So you you explained the differences between these surgical interventions. Can you tell us a little bit about these advantages and when they're recommended? So if somebody's uh, refractory to various medications, and that's probably the first thing we approach is, is this something we can do definitively to make a seizure go away, trying to find the focus? In order to find the focus, we have to do uh, inpatient video EEG monitoring study where the patients are wearing the EEG and we reduce the medication and by analyzing the video during the um, seizure event and the EEG electroencephalogram, we can actually come up with seizure focus. If that's not going to be enough information, we do the second phase of the monitoring. This is when we put electrodes inside the brain um, to make a small hole and advance the electrodes inside the brain, the targeted, the area that we think the seizures are coming from, but not uncertain, not 100% certain. And with that phase two, or we call it stereotactic EEG, then we get gather more information, more specific information, and those patients may go into epilepsy surgery as well too. When we cannot find the seizure focus, or we we decided that area of seizure focus is dangerous area or functional area causing more problem. If we remove that part, then we can resort to other modalities. I mentioned the DBS, RNS, and VNS. One big difference between the DBS and RNS and uh, VNS is this. DBS, deep brain stimulation, or VNS, vagus nerve stimulator, is on and off around the clock. The stimulation is on with a specific area targeted in the brain and the vagus nerve is on and off regardless if the person has a seizure or not. So we call this a neuromodulation. By stimulating intermittently, it somehow changed the firing patterns of the brain, hoping that that will reduce the number of seizures. RNS is a little bit more specific towards epileptic zone. This is a device we put the electrodes where we think seizures are coming from, but but uncertain or the functional area. And this one is a closed loop. So device will record the seizure activities and only when device is programmed, device is, uh, device is detecting the seizure itself, then deliver the electric simulation to subdue the seizure. So this is a really on-demand closed loop versus uh, other two, VNS and DBS, that is around the clock regardless person has seizure or not. And all of that is monitored by the team and the, the epilepsy specialist, correct? Absolutely right. So the epileptologist will be the one who will program this device and analyzing the data. But neurosurgeons obviously are the ones that who put these electrodes into the patients. We have a whole team approaching and dealing with the patients coming from outside. Yeah. So refer, we try to make it very easy. The patient be referred to us whether it's a simple evaluation or the epilepsy monitoring study or even surgical evaluation. So that's why we have a nurse navigator who can facilitate this kind of process. Not only the one way from their care to us, but sometimes relaying what we are about to do and what we have accomplished, we want to share that with the referring doctors as well too. And this again, the the nurse navigator's vital function is to facilitate communication bidirectionally. So it's it's clear, you know, in, in what you're sharing with us that the epilepsy surgery requires very specialized expertise. Can you shed light on why Banner Health and your center in particular stands out in this field? Well, a number of things. As you can see, this is such a team effort. I cannot do it alone. I need my colleagues' input. We have nurse navigators and MAs coordinating all these different type of uh, evaluations and the surgical procedures and obviously neurosurgeons who are well trained. These are not just a, a typical neurosurgeons. They are actually trained specifically dealing with this type of epilepsy patients. So it's a team approach. 
And I think we are uh, fortunate to have an excellent team. And we work together. We actually get together regularly once a week to talk about each patient that are candidate for different type of surgical entities. And we then discuss what might be the best approach to provide, whether it's a resection, laser, or further research medications, or the other devices. We then make a group decision. And this is actually a vital function of our epilepsy team. And for patients, uh, when they have some kind of a decision making, it's not just a my decision, it's that come as a group decision after talking about all the information we gather up, up until that point. So that's the one thing. The other thing is we like to be providing patients with a minimalistic approach. When we talk about neurosurgery, even though we have very good neurosurgeon, it is a brain surgery, and patients are, are sometimes reticent to go through the epilepsy surgery, and rightly so. So we like to offer the minimalist approach. If we're going to remove the part of the brain, two things. Number one, we want to have a smallest opening or scars outside. And second, we want to remove as little as possible to retain some of the function that could be lost during the operation. So one of the techniques that we utilize often and we specialize in is the laser ablation. So rather than using typical way of a craniotomy, go into that, lifting some of the part of the brain, we used to actually take out some part of the brain that's unrelated to seizures in order to get access to the internal structure of the brain called hippocampus. And obviously that caused more problems. So now we have a technique that utilizing the laser probe rather than removing part of it, we just poke through the brain, reaching to the deeper part of the brain causing seizures, and then the laser ablation technique. Recovery is much faster, and then it does not require craniotomy, therefore hospital stay also is quite less compared to the conventional ways of doing it. Thank you for that. And, and it is, you know, when we look at our level four accreditation for the epilepsy center, that multidisciplinary approach, our team of specialists, and our banner specialists work very close with the referring community. So the primary care, the, the general neurologist. Can you walk us through that referral process for epilepsy surgery and who typically refers those patients and what are some of those qualifying metrics that a patient needs to meet in order to consider some of these surgical interventions? Yeah, anybody can actually refer their patients to us for epilepsy surgery or for the evaluation of epilepsy or just a simple epilepsy treatment since we know all different type of epilepsy medications, how the combination may may not work for the individual. So the answer is anybody, but typically we have patients referred by neurologists in the region, Phoenix and sometimes uh, Colorado, uh, Las Vegas area and the uh, eastern part of California, and then the uh, Albuquerque. So those are the more of a catchment area for us. And the neurologist uh, cannot deal with their seizures or cannot control the seizures, whether two or three, or conventional use of their medication, then they send to us. Uh, our idea here is, first of all, we have to make a correct diagnosis. Sometimes we're dealing with something called non-epileptic seizures. So they are not epileptic seizures in classic sense that there's no EEG markers with it that we have to find out whether they have a true epileptic or non-epileptic because non-epileptic patients, for, for non-epileptic patients, seizure medication does not work at all. It's more of approaching with the psychosocial issues. If we define the patient has a seizures, then we have to first divide into focal or generalized onset of seizures. And the reason we do that is, number one, Medication choice is different. Sometimes they're taking wrong medication for their type of seizures, and we have to rectify that. Other times is patient education, that we like to provide the outcome and, and what we can provide for the patient, including surgical option, can be quite different uh, when you compare focal versus generalized onset epilepsy. So right now we have a patients coming from multiple states, and uh, especially in the local area, not only the Banner hospitals, but other uh, system as well too. Uh, we welcome anyone. I think it's a nice thing that the Banner actually accept 
many different um, insurance carriers widely. So we actually can provide more care for the patients with epilepsy. That's wonderful. Thank you for that overview. Going back to surgical procedures and patient care, can you share with us a little bit about the after-surgery care? Yeah. What does that post-operative care process entail, and do patients typically continue with medications? Yeah, that's actually a very important question. So a lot of people come to us, and once they become seizure-free, not everybody becomes seizure-free, by the way, but when they become seizure-free, one of the first things they want to ask is, what do I do with the medication? Now the epileptic zone is gone, should I stop my medication? Well, we approach them more cautiously. There are many studies done. Initially, after about two or three years, we tend to stop the medication altogether. But we found out that about 40 to 30% of those population who become seizure-free after surgery, even many years later, they have start having seizures again. So we don't really approach epilepsy surgery as a cure, but rather as a treatment. Therefore, many of the patients have to continue to take their medication. However, if they're taking high dosage of medication or many different number of medications, we can reduce the dose or reduce the number of medication they can take. Our optimal goal is once the uh, surgery was successful, we, we want to bring down to kind of uh, average dose of uh, one medication rather than multiple medications. So Dr. Chung, at Banner University Medicine, with the University of Arizona College of Medicine, mm -hmm. we have access to clinical trials. Yes. Um, we have access to you know new research and advancements in, in care. Mm -hmm. Is there anything on the forefront or in the future of, of epilepsy care here at Banner and with the College of Medicine? Yeah, there are several things I, I think uh, is very important to mention. One is, it's not just another medication we have a clinical trials. We have sometimes a very unique and f very different from the existing medications, mechanistically and how it works in the body and brain. So there are the opportunities that patient otherwise are not able to, to test it out. So we provide those kind of access to the medication through the clinical trials. The other part is how we understand seizures and brain function overall. Traditionally, even when I was in medical school, we talked about, okay, this part of the brain controls that, that part of the brain controls the language, and so on. So it's a very compartmentalized brain of, uh, understanding function approach. But now we kind of a more fluid model. So brain is truly so, it's a network rather than compartmental function. So they're all connected as you know. So network meaning connection, and seizure spreading, seizure may start with a small, maybe eye twitching and then moving into the whole body convulsion. Obviously, there's a network of neurons get involved to get bigger and convulsive seizures. So sometimes we have to address how this propagation of electrical discharges in the brain gets to the point where somebody has convulsions. So if we cannot address the very starting point or cannot find it, at least we can interrupt the neuronal network. So that's actually a new approach. Sometimes neuronal network and disturbing that is a lot more important than addressing the focus of it. And there's been studies been showing again and again how neuronal network approach of a neurological disorder, not just epilepsy, but dementia and stroke, all these kind of things, MS, all these kind of things are very important to understand how the network works. We are actually doing some studies uh, looking at that network of the brain when patients have a seizures. So we are going to be addressing the area that has a highly engaged in network might be the area we need to address rather than only the seizure focus. So it has a little bit different understanding approach of a surgical end and also the understanding of seizures. So I think that's going to be quite interesting once we have the better outcome by addressing the network rather than simply the seizure focus. That's fascinating. Is there anything else that you want to share or any take home messages for either our referring physician or our patients that may be listening? Yeah, one of the things that we emphasize is uh, uh, building the relationship with the referring doctors. We actually invite them uh, when we have a weekly conference talking about the surgical entity, surgical patients, we like to invite those referring doctors 
to be engaged and involved in the uh, decision making process and they'll be informed and educated as well too so we view that as a more partnership and I think that worked out very well for us in the region so we are going to continue to pursue that uh, relationship building approach uh, for the benefit of patients and better care for the patients one of the things I find very remarkable is how our patients are living daily with these uh, unexpected things that can occur in any given moment. If uh, look at what human beings are most fearful about, it is about unknowns. You name it, and if you don't know whether it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, that's where we build our anxiety. Unfortunately, seizures are just like that. It is uh, highly unpredictable, and in a, it can occur any given mom moment without having, having any uh, specific trigger factors. So I all, always refer our patients as very courageous people living through these unknowns daily. And that also motivates me and our team to provide the better care for our patients. Oh, I love that. Once a patient has been diagnosed with epilepsy, yeah. it can be life changing. You know, oh, they, it, it you know they're is. driving, yeah. they're caretaking, the you know, that some of the things that they could do by themselves alone that you know, maybe they shouldn't or it's not recommended. Is that something that you'd like to, to discuss a little? The seizure patients actually face many different challenges in life. It's not just the seizures. The seizure may be once a month, maybe more, maybe less, but they have to suffer through potential side effects from the medications. And there are many unknowns in epilepsy care and associated symptoms. Common ones are the cognitive side effects because it's a brain disorder, a lot of people have memory function deficit, concentration problems, and job performance. Driving is another restriction. If you have a seizures, you cannot drive a car until you become seizure free for at least 90 days. That's a difficult task to achieve. So many people cannot even work properly because they can't drive a car or function properly at work due to the cognitive dysfunction. Another very important thing is emotional liability or behavioral changes. It is known that the patient with epilepsy has the highest instance of uh, anxiety and depression than any other chronic disorders. So it is important to recognize when we approach the epilepsy patients or patients with a seizure disorder, it's not just controlling the seizures, but we have to think about some other social issues and also the other symptoms and that becomes very important because some of the seizure medications do cause cognitive and behavioral problems. And we want to be highly selective for those medications and avoid if you already have those symptoms. Yet some medication can actually improve some of this mood and even approved by FDA for the mood disorder. So we have to know quite detail about each medication and patient history to match up and provide the best solution for the patient. And I think that's where our comprehensive epilepsy center and the yeah. care team that we have really helps with that. Yeah. Do we provide any patient resources? Do we assist them once they've been diagnosed? Yeah, so best resource that we have here is Epilepsy Foundation. It's a part of the National Epilepsy Foundation of America. And we do have a patient education symposia as well as a patient events. It could be art function or sometimes a camping for the youngsters. So there are some resources and social support for the patients with epilepsy through the Epilepsy Foundation. We, as a banner, um, physicians and the providers actively engage in the activities. And one of our neuropsychologists is currently on the uh, board of the uh, Epilepsy Foundation. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Dr. Chung, for providing this invaluable insight into the world of epilepsy treatment and surgical intervention. And it's clear that Banner Health's expertise in making a significant difference in the lives of many of our patients that are living with epilepsy. If you want to learn more about the neurology specialists and the programs available at Banner Health, please visit bannerhealth.com forward slash neurology for more information. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time on Making the Rounds.